Kia ora koutou and kao ja. Thank you for the honour of presenting you to you today at the start of this important forum to consider transparency and anti-corruption in business with a focus on recruitment and labour rights. I greet again Minister Zhu Ming Chun from the Ministry of Labour and Minister Sai Ching Xian from the Ministry of Justice. It is very good to address you again and to see your continued determination to prevent and reveal corruption. I also greet other attendees from ministries, unions and associations. In this presentation, I and two colleagues will talk about the importance of ensuring that migrant recruitment and other exploitative practices are not enabled. For Transparency International New Zealand, our focus is anti-corruption. There is plenty of evidence in New Zealand and overseas that corruption can become embedded in migrant employment. Such as pra practices such as excessive charges and kickbacks should not be accepted as the way we do business, but should be seen as fraudulent and corrupt. We acknowledge the issue is complex. And in New Zealand, our government and businesses also face this challenge. We have just seen revelations in New Zealand of alleged corrupt charging of fees. Mr King will talk about how migrant work workers help to sustain growth and the impact of corruption on labour supply. He will also talk about the importance of having broad labour legislation. Mr Todd Cooper will talk more about ensuring that procurement does not set the ground for exploitation. So I will now introduce the other speakers, starting with Mr King, who is an expert in modern slavery. Good morning, Mr Daniel King. My first question is, what do migrant workers bring to an economy and, and to society? Well, we're very reliant on migrant workers in our society. Um, they work in horticulture, viticulture. 50% of all nurses in New Zealand were born overseas. So they are critically important to our society and to our uh, economy. That's great. Now, we've just seen public exposure of migrant exploitation in New Zealand where workers were charged fees to get to, to work in New Zealand and that didn't end up in actual employment in many cases. How does this kind of, how do exploitative practices affect migrant workers and their families? Well, a lot of migrant workers, um, they're sending money home to their families. Um, and when they incur huge debts, they're not able to do that. So it has a, a knock-on knock on, uh, um, no. Knock on effect. Yeah. And what's what's the thing that's fundamentally unfair about about the kind of recruitment fees that are being charged? What is it that's unfair? Well, I question whether they add any value at all. A paying money for a job just doesn't seem right to me. And I, I don't I question what, what, what these recruitment companies actually provide. Thanks very much. At a minimum, any company needs a clear public expression of their commitment to international recognised human rights standards. These should be reflected in any procurement activity that they undertake. There are three interrelated elements that I feel a company can do to help address instances of worker exploitation within their supply chain. The first one is planning. So they need to be really concise with their market scanning using available tools such as um, the Corru Corruption Perception Index from Transparency International. This gives them a clear picture where corruption is more likely to be prevalent in countries that they're working with. Also, they need to plan and resource um, you know, the management um, of any procurement activity so that they're monitoring the supplies, logging issues, undertaking audits, um, reporting and um, focusing on whistleblowing. And the other thing they need to do is establish ethical frameworks that reflect their view as a company um, and their values around slavery and worker exploitation. So that's the first thing planning. The second thing is you know, having really good processes. So we hear a lot of talk about due diligence in terms of selecting of suppliers. Too often due diligence only focuses on the financial aspects. What we need to do is we need to be better around you know, ESG or environmental, social and governance, um, including ethical criteria around the due diligence processes. We also need to start to embed um, within the management of supplies, good KPIs um, that focus on ethical compliance. And, and finally, you know, undertaking on-premise supply audits. So getting on, you know, on site, having the opportunity to talk to workers, you know, uh, independently, um, just to see how things are going and getting a good feel. 
And, and the third, and I think probably one of the most important things as an organisation is that they, they focus on what policies they will introduce. Um, supplier code of conduct are a critical one and make, making sure that that does reflect you know, their stance on human rights. Um, whistleblowing policies are critical to allow people to have a voice and human rights policies as well is something that I'm starting to see come in in organisations as they do take a true stance on, um, on you know, being a good global citizen. Thank you. I think a key message is that all parties need to work together towards solutions and that solutions should be bold, addressing all elements in the labour recruitment process. And lastly, noting that we in New Zealand face similar challenges to those faced in Taiwan. I do wish you well in your discussion today and we will be keen to hear about your achievements in the future. Thank you.